Good evening. Uh, we are again uh, here in this webinar series. We have just now completed four years and we are entering to the fifth year and uh, first lecture of this fifth year is going to be by Professor Paolo Biaggi, a senior professor from uh, Italy who has uh, worked extensively in the Sindh region of Pakistan and also on the Makran coast as well as the Oman coast. I got to uh, know about Professor Biaggi through his uh, articles, various articles, his work on the Rory area, and also in connection with my recent uh, work in the Kutch region where I happened to find some shell midden sites. Then I started a series of discussions with him and he was a, a very good uh, source of inspiration and he actually taught me many things and he also asked me to look into many different aspects of the shell middens, which is now becoming more and more uh, uh, important to understand the early hunter-gatherer communities of this region. So uh, without wasting much time, I I uh, am really happy to have all of you. I thank all the participants uh, who have joined here and I also uh, especially thank Professor Biaji to agree, agree to deliver this talk. And uh, we have with us uh, Professor Sharda and also Professor Michelle Danino, uh, who are uh, with us in this Archaeological Sciences Center. And uh, uh, we are also expecting Professor Biaji in the month of uh, January here, who will be joining us for two months uh, to collaborate and also to look into our material and also the sites where we are working. So I request uh, Purva to briefly introduce Professor Biaji, uh, then uh, he can deliver. I will share the presentation. I have the presentation with me. I will share the presentation. Yeah, Purva. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to 49th lecture of AC webinar series. Today, we have the honor of hosting a distinguished scholar, Professor Paolo Biaggi. Professor Biaggi is an eminent archaeologist renowned for his extensive contributions in the field of archaeology. He earned his PhD from the prestigious Institute of Archaeology at London University and served as a full professor at Kafuskari University of Venice, where he specialized in paleoethnology. Throughout his career, Professor Biaggi has directed significant international archaeological missions across Middle East, Europe, and South Asia, focusing in particular on early human settlements and archaeological <clears throat> landscapes, notably within Pakistan. His scholarly output includes 462 research articles, two book prefaces, and 12 review articles, among other works. He, in addition to these contributions, he serves as a respected peer reviewer for leading academic journals, honored with the title of Professor Honoris Causa by esteemed institutions in Ukraine, Professor Biaggi's work has had a lasting impact on the discipline of archaeology, advancing uh, our knowledge of ancient human societies and their development. For today's talk, Professor Biaggi will discuss the shell maidens of Arabian Sea and their importance in the archaeology of regions. Before we delve into stimulating discussions, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Biaggi for taking out his valuable time to share his expertise with us. Sir, you may please begin with your presentation. Thank you. So, fine. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. and. Uh, it's been a very great pleasure to, to receive an invitation from you um, because this is my first time I give a lecture in India. Never been to India, you know, been to Pakistan so many years. But it is something very new and very interesting for me. Okay, what what is uh, what is the, the general general idea? Is just uh, <clears throat> to show you what um, I and my colleagues did. Uh, along the coast of the Arabian Sea, starting first from Oman and then continue to uh, Pakistan, that is Sindh and Balochistan. And uh, the reason why Shalmid is so important and uh, what we found uh, during more than 30, 40 years of work uh, along the coasts of the two different countries. So I start first. Uh, this first picture, I think it's very interesting for you. I don't know if you have some such, such kind of environment, but maybe yes. 
This is what uh, is called nowadays Lake Sieranda. You see, it is a very, very shallow depression where nobody ever found anything. I don't know why, but it's full of shell meadows around it. Uh, not only uh, huge heaps, uh, you see some of them, but also very, very small concentrations of shells. It is very, very shallow. It's very close to Miani Hall and it's very, very close to the uh, Arabian Sea, and it is extremely important. Uh, 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 I will tell you why. So the second idea, which I think is interesting for, for you and the students, is um, to give you some idea about the variability of the science. That's why I, I took some slides from Oman, uh, okay, sounds like from Pakistan, dif different things. Not, uh, not it's not a, a very homogeneous uh, uh, kind of, of lecture which I'm going to give to to, to you today. So, what uh, what is uh, in my interest? Uh, what is the interest of some some other people? Not not, not so many people in, in effect. Anyway, some is uh, is uh, this region. The Arabian Sea, which uh, at least during the Bronze Age worked uh, like uh, a closed sea, not like the Mediterranean, but like something like that. But during the Neolithic and before that, uh, when exactly, I can't tell you because I don't know, it was quite a different situation. So Oman, you see Oman, you see also the Dofa. I, I pointed, I, I, I put some dots uh, in some areas like this one, this is Muscat, this is Razal Had, this is the Mazira Island, and then I, I put uh, I put some dots in in Las Bela, which is this triangular region of east and southeast and Baluchistan, and then Sin, and then here you have Gujarat. You know, all all these areas are pretty close to to each other. In the caption, I put. Something else which is interesting, if somebody wants to study the shell meters, that is, uh, these areas were very, very well known during the Greek and, and Roman periods because of the presence of uh, the fish eaters, the ichthyophagoids, those people who eat only fish. They lived in, along the Macran coast, they lived along the coast of Oman, not exactly in Las Vegas, there were other people in Las Vegas. This is also very important because Alexander the Great, uh, on the way back to Babylon, just a few years, the three, four years, three years, I think, before dying, had the very, very bad idea of crossing this landscape, which is a, a, a disaster for, for living. There is no water, and uh, he lost uh, more than 60,000 people along uh, this way back uh, to to Babylon. Let's go to the next one. Next uh, slide. Okay. When uh, we started to work uh, on shell meetings, was a period when Khomeini entered, uh, you know, politics in Iran. So the Italian archaeological missions to Iran had to move somewhere else. <laughs> now the idea was the uh, to, to start working in an area which nobody knew very, very much, or better, almost nothing. So we started to work on the shell meadows located very, very close to Muscat. Muscat is, is this city, which you can see over here on top of the, on top of the slide. And the, the main site which I excavated for many years, for four or five years, I don't remember now, is this one. You see there is a huge gray spot on top of the cape. This is the Cape of Ras Hamra, the Red Cape. There's another site which is over here. This site number five, this site number ten. There were very, very many others. Nowadays the cape is totally different because it's been uh, destroyed by urbanization as, as it is usual. But anyway, just to give you a very, very clear uh, idea of the landscape, have a look at this picture. This picture is, 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 is classic, it's fantastic. You see a mangrove swamp, you see the Batina coast, which comes down from from from, from the north, from, uh, 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 from the northern part from the Emirates. Here you have the mangrove swamp again, and here you have the Cape and the terraces, the limestone terraces on which uh, uh, the shell meters are located. And then you have uh, 
here on the back you can see that you have the mountains and then you have the Indian Ocean. So it is a very, very complex landscape which was ideal for people to settle and uh, for fishers to settle, but not only fishers, uh, they had also domesticates and whatever. And here, all over this point here, we have shell, we had now, now be destroyed shell midden sites. RH5 is this one, RH5 is this one, the cave is this one, RH6 is here, where it was very, very close to the mangrove swamp. Uh, next one. Okay. So when um, we worked in uh, RH5, uh, there were no whites in, uh, in, in Oman. It was a more or less forbidden country. So we had facilities to, to go anywhere. We did uh, a lot of surveys and so on. We discovered a lot of sites. Here you have another fantastic view of the small village of Sur. And here you see there is a, a fort, a Portuguese fort, straight on, on at the edge of the Cape. And inside it, you see a black spot. The black spot is a shell midden. This is not a very typical location for you know, money shell midden. And uh, uh, we discover many like this. Now the landscape is totally different. It's completely, uh, uh, it's not so wild, if you want to, to use the word wild, as it was uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. It's changed completely. But here you have an idea of what the, the, the landscape was like. So, why are shell midden so important for archaeologists? They're extremely important because they, they are, uh, first of all, they're very rich in organogenic uh, uh, material. That is, shells and charcoal. In some cases, you have turtle bones, you have fish bones, whatever you want. And so they can be very easily radiocarbon dated. And then there is something else which is, uh, which is very important. They give you a very, uh, these tropical shell meters, I mean, uh, the Pakistani ones, the, the, the Indian ones, and, and, and whatever, they give you an immediate idea of what some of the landscape was when people lived there. For example, they tell you exactly the age, radiocarbon dated the shells, of mangroves which have now disappeared. And they give you also an idea of uh, the landscape, uh, which was like uh, maybe, I don't know, five, six thousand, seven thousand years ago, and what the variations are. So the tropical shell means are extremely important, as are the European ones. You know that uh, prehistory in Europe started. Uh, at the end of the 17th century with uh, Warsaw, with uh, Thompson, whatever, in Denmark. And what did they do first? The first, uh, uh, you know, interest of these people were shell middens. So shell middens are known since uh, more than two centuries and uh, 30, 40 years. Extremely interesting. Okay, let's go to the, to the next one. Uh, which is, uh, you know, the two pictures on the top give you an idea of what the shell midden of uh, uh, Radal Hamra 5, that is Muscat Oman, was like. Here you see very clearly a pit. Here you can see post holes and, uh, you know, depressions, pits and fireplaces and whatever. Uh, excavating very accurately the sites we understood that uh, uh, the houses, were, the, the huts, or whatever they were, were most probably rounded or semicircular. We had the first impression now it has been demonstrated by, by excavation carried out in more in more accurate way than the ones they did in those years. But here you can see very clearly what the situation, the stratigraphic situation was like. On the surface, you have white stuff shells. In the profile, you have uh, different colors, brownish fish, you know, uh, whitish, again, ash, 
charcoal or whatever. So this is a very complicated kind of shell minas, which was inhabited throughout a period of about 1,000 years. And uh, it is not just shells. It is shells and many other different things. So it is a kind of shell mina, which is um, uh, common to the landscape in Oman. There are also burials and whatever you want. But if you move down to the two pictures, now it's just one picture below, this is a location which uh, which was like this very many years ago, it, near in Dofar, the very, very beginning of Dofar. Dofar is the, the, the southernmost part of uh, the Omani Peninsula, is Ras Shabitat. And here you, hear, you see a house which had been inhabited uh, maybe four, five, ten years before I went there which is very interesting, it's rectangular, big, whatever you want. And here, just in front of it, you have a semicircular structure. But there's something else, this white stuff, which is extremely interesting, if you want to excavate shell meters in some cases. So this is a house, fine. What is this? There's something unique, there's something interesting, because this is a place where male uh, after 16, you know, when they were going to grow up, slept, that is, outside the house which was inhabited by the family, by the couple and whatever, the, 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 the uh, grown-up people couldn't live, uh, couldn't speak, live inside. And here the white stuff is something extremely interesting. It's a very, very tiny sheet of uh, marine shells, uh, sometimes they are, uh, they are columbella, you know, they're very, very tiny, tiny shells, which are two or three uh, centimeters long and not more. And uh, it is like a carpet. And before building a house and before building the, 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 the what is this? And before building the, the wall, people put this kind of material just for decoration or just... Uh, for, for taste or something else. But anyway, all the houses, also this one over here, has the same kind of features. And this is very interesting because sometimes when you excavate a shell middens, I will show you in the next slide, you find tiny, small, tiny, I mean, one centimeter or even less of very small marine shells, which might indicate the presence of, of a house. Next one. And this is the case. This is an extremely important site. It is a, a RH6, it is mangrove swamp of Kurum, that is Muscat. The site is over here. This is one of the trenches we opened, one here and another one over here. And here is a profile. You see, that in this case, we were very, very lucky because the stratigraphy was very easy to follow, very horizontal, you know, there's something, a disturbance over here, maybe a pit or whatever you want, but here is black, charcoal, here is white again, it is shells, and here is sand, and then you have uh, structures inside the bedrock, and we still don't understand how they excavated them, but roughly over here, there is very, very tiny, you know, level of marine shells, which uh, might represent something similar to the situation in Shabitat, which I showed you before. So, when we excavated uh, RH6, which is uh, quite an old site because it is a uh, seventh millennium, early sixth millennium uh, uh, BC, B BP before present, we uh, used the flotation machine and we collected everything. You see a lot of charcoal. A lot of shells, quite a huge amount of fish and turtles and, what, and so on. So throughout 1,000 years, all these different levels accumulated one above the other. It is more than one meter thick. It is still there. If you go to Muscat, you can, you can see it. Maybe not in this condition, but anyway, it is there. And it is very interesting because this site was settled Immediately, I think, 1,000 years before the other side of RH5 was settled. They are different. The location is different. This is lower down, very close to the ocean. The other one is on top of the terraces. And uh, one follows the others. Okay, let's move to, to the next one. So, uh, 
after working for 12 years in Oman, I, I decided to try to move somewhere else, at least to, to Pakistan, which is just uh, in front of, uh, of Oman. In effect, uh, our mission to Oman was uh, a mission to Oman and Balochistan, but nobody ever went to Balochistan. I was the only one to go and work there because, because it is not... Uh, also nowadays, it is not so easy for a white to, to go there. But here you have an idea of uh, a river which is also familiar to you. It is the delta of the Indus with uh, the main branches and so on. And all this region here, for example, is a huge mangrove swamp. And, um, uh, okay, the, the, the you know the, the delta is growing a, every day every year a, every decade or whatever despite the the, the, the disaster they they made uh, uh, building so many dams uh, along the river especially in Punjab but anyway it is growing slowly and uh, here we don't have shell meters but we have some shell scatters shell uh, you know, heaps and uh, whatever just a little bit out of 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 the the, the mangroves and and the real delta over here so what uh, what characterizes uh, the the shell meters here no not the shell meters but this kind of landscapes here you have uh, a picture of uh, uh a common, very common situation in the Las Bela and in, in the in in in, in the uh, mangrove swamps in general. Here you have Avicennia marina. You can recognize it very very easily. It is very thick, very beautiful. The trees in Las Bela are quite high and huge, and there are many other individuals which are growing over here. You see them the the the. the these ticks which have come out are very, very young bushes. And between them, you see some interesting white spots. One, two, three, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And here they look, yes, here they are. They, they look quite uh, small, but they are not. They are sometimes are 20 centimeters long. What are they? Uh, this is very beautiful because these are uh, telescopium, telescopium shells, sunbathing uh, during during the winter. They stay out uh, in uh, in 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 the sun and enjoy the sun all day long. That's very beautiful uh, situation which you, maybe you can enc encounter also in, in some of your areas where you have mangrove swamps still growing nicely. Okay, let's move to to the next one. And uh, before continuing with the shell meters of, of Pakistan, I wanted uh, the idea was to show you something something different. This location is very is very important. Okay, this is the Hub River, uh, the Arabis of Alexander the Great, where the the Greeks, not the Greeks, the Macedonians crossed. Uh, uh, the river uh, roughly here, which divides uh, Sindh from Balochistan. And these are the southern fringes of the of the Kirtan range. Okay, they go down into the sea at Tras Muari, which is this cape here. Karachi is roughly maybe 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers to the east. This is a beautiful situation. You see, there is a small village. There is a Hub River mouth, as it is now, and here are some points. Okay, some dots. Uh, okay, which uh, show you that uh, a few years ago we collected uh, some shells for radiocarbon dating. Let's go to the to the next one. This is, again, a situation we've seen before. But the point is that, that this is a hub river mouth, this one. Now it is very dirty because they, they built up a, a, a power station over here, very unfortunately. Uh, these are mountains, okay. This is a, a village. There's another village, which is Baluchi or down Mubarak. 
down to the to the south and southwest. And here you see that we collected uh, shells for radiocarbon dating from different areas. And they gave different results. Two are clearly Neolithic, this one and that one. And then we have Bronze Age, Copper Age, and more recent sites scattered all over the area. So what we did uh, that year when we went to, to, to Sonari, when we went to the Hub River mouth, was to, uh, okay, GPS locate uh, all the different uh, scatters and concentration of shells, collect one or two samples, that's enough, for radiocarbon dating, and have an idea what happened in the area. Next one. We have a, a long list uh, from, uh, okay, from uh, uh, the site of Sonari, which is the one I will show you uh, just after this one. But now uh, we can discuss what uh, what we did because it's very it's very interesting. Uh, what what is the important thing for for this diagram? Okay, you see, we took um, with, with radiocarbon date all the sites we found. Pirsha Jurio is the is the typical late Harappan site, late Indus civilization site. He is a Chinese. Uh, uh, he is an Islamic tomb with some Chinese pottery and whatever. But if you have a look at the different colors, the different colors are to indicate the shells, species, which we used for dating. So Miratic is the Bible, okay, the sand environment. The turbo is not, it's not interesting for us in this case, but if you have a look at the green and you have a look at the back, at the black, you see they are mangrove swamp shells, classical, and they start to appear here and they continue down to here. Before this period, the landscape was not suitable for the life of this kind of, of these, these two different species. What does it mean? There was no mango swamp. Fine. The so mango swamp started to, to grow roughly around 3,000 years before Christ in calibrated years. There's nothing before, there's nothing, there's uh, many things before. But anyway, there were no mango swamps before. And then uh, the mango swamps continued to, to develop, but not uh, uh, in a continuous way. They developed and then they interrupted and whatever throughout a very, very long period of time. So if we move the sonari, this is the name of the site. Now I'll show you what the, the site uh, we found is like in the next slide. Because you see, oh, no, uh, okay, fine. There's a landscape. The Hub River mouth is this one. You see the landscape is rather flat. The, the hills uh, you know, coming down from, 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 the north, um, from the northeast to the southwest. All along here, we found uh, traces of, uh, uh, of shells, you know, like this one, for example. But when we moved up, uh, to the saddle, we climbed up for maybe 50, 60, 70 meters, I don't remember now, we found an incredible situation, which is this one from the saddle, from, 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 from the entrance of the saddle. And then I will show you in the next slide better what uh, the situation was like. Extremely interesting and very unexpected. The next one, this has been published. Oh, this is a, a Islamic tomb, fine, down into, into the valley with, uh, you know, it is oriented. Uh, there are some Chinese uh, uh, pottery pot shells, not so many, but they are most probably to be attributed to the 16th century uh, after Christ. This one, for example. Next one. Okay, and here you have uh, an idea of what uh, the saddle is like. Like this, we entered from here, this is a small pass. We went straight to this point. If you 
look at this uh, Google map, uh, Google Earth map. If you have a look at this uh, area over here, you see that you see very clearly that it is very, very regular and more or less C-shaped. It is maybe 30 meters wide. Okay, what is this? This is a fantastic Bronze Age site. You know, Bronze Age sites are very rare along the coast of Sindh. And, uh, you know, even so many people say they are strictly related with the with trade of the area. There, there is all, all, almost nothing along the coast of Sindh. And this is extremely interesting. And we took shells for dating from this point, from that point, from this point again. And then we checked all this area, and this area you see very clear that it is whitish, right? It is a huge shell midden with a lot of fantastic stuff, stuff which we radiocarbon dated from this point. And then we moved just a little bit up, maybe 10, 15 meters uh, above the, the the plain, above the the, the saddle, and uh, we found the marine shells, okay, bivalves. At this point and uh, at another point over here, we dated them. There were no no artifacts, no no man-made flints or I don't know shells, whatever you want, just shells. And these two days are identical as they are related to the early habitation of the, of the area. So it's nearly the now let's have a look at this uh, really fantastic uh, uh, site. It is a fisher, fisher, fisher site. It's not uh, something huge like like Dolapir or Mohenjo Daro or whatever. Nothing like that. Absolutely different. Anyway, this is a site. You see, and uh, within the site, we didn't excavate. We didn't do anything. We just collected some sample for radiocarbon dating, and that's why we took pictures. Nothing else. You see. That within the sites are several, I don't, I don't remember stone yet. Seven are, are the ones which are visible, cabins, which are all oriented in two different directions. Perfect, north, south, or east, west. And this is something we noted also for Oman Arazunais, for example. Exactly the same orientation, very precise. And the floors, this one, this one is the same thing. Over here, over there, there are seven all together. And the floors are all covered with uh, marine uh, bivalves, meretics, yeah, meretrix. And we rad radiocarbon dated them. And we found some items which are extremely interesting. We've collected also some pottery, just uh, a few tiny pieces, not so many. But anyway, the four hours, this one, extremely interesting. There's another point which is. Um, which was uh, surprising for us. I knew the site because I, I went there the first time at, about 30 years ago with, with Professor Han, who was a, a, a geologist and geomorphologist of Karachi University, and he knew the prehistory of the, the region very, very, very well and very, very accurately. I went there for the first time with him, and then I refound the site because I did remember the road to go up there. The site is hidden. You cannot see it. It is very well hidden. It's not along the coast. It, it is in a place where, where, which you cannot absolutely see from the, uh, the coast and from the plain. So let's go to the next uh, slide to have a look at, um, at what, uh, what we found on the surface of, uh, of the cabins of the, of the of the uh, Bronze Age side. Net waves, like this one, like that one. We found also grinding stone, which is still there, as we found it. And uh, we found only one um, uh, bladelet, uh, slightly retouched. You can see the retouch over, he over here, which has been used uh, for cutting, OK? Which is not uh, a, a, a which is not made of material which is locally available. It's something which came from Sindh, from the upper, not upper part, but anyway, from the rolling hills or somewhere else, which is uh, oh. exogenous and not local. Uh, flint of this type does not exist in the area. There's flint, 
in Baluchistan in uh, in Las Vela, which is a dark red jasper and is very easy to to recognize. So this is the kind of stuff we have from the surface of the site. And if we move to the next uh, slides again, you see what the, the net weights are like. You know, they're all very similar, not identical. They have different uh, weights, some are more are bigger, some are smaller. Maybe they, 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 they practice different kind of, um, of fishing. And then we have also some instruments like this one, which are slightly retouched. This one is also retouched, but also very, very weathered. Next one. And uh, here again, we have other tools which, uh, which come from uh, the site of um, the site of Sonari, an anvil. There's some retouched artifacts uh, like this one. Maybe this is another uh, tool which has been used by, by fishers. Then there is a hammerstone, maybe used for opening the shells. I don't know, I can't tell you. And here is also, uh, this anvil has been beaten also over here. And here is a depression, here is another. Place. These kind of tools are very, very common in Oman, in the fisher site. Next one. What else we found, and these pieces have been studied very, very accurately uh, by, by a colleague of mine who, who, who is at British Museum now, we found some pot shirts. Not very many, very, very uh, in a, a disaster condition. But anyway, one is uh, has uh, some a painty, painty surface, uh, but they are extremely interesting because these locations, this area, is midway between Sindh, it is still in Sindh, very close to the Hub River, but it's not very, very far from the Persian Gulf. So what we know there, we know very, very little. We have only one site, which is uh, famous, and the uh, worst location uh, I, I will show you in one of the next uh, slides. So pottery, you know, uh, net weights, uh, some chart, uh, and uh, many possibilities for radiocarbon dating the different uh, areas from which we have shells of different species. Next one, please. Oh, so now we go we go back to the shell, the real shell business. Here, I uh, yeah, this is seen, you know that this is Las Bella. This triangle over here this is a very important river, which is dry. It looks dry during most of the years of the year, but it is not dry at all. Here is a, an area from which we have shell millers. It is a small bay of the Un. Uh, here is another another area from from which we have a, a few indications of shell millers. It is Rasgadani, which is very famous for. The chert, uh, red chert outcrops, yes, this is Daun, this is Rasgadani. And then if we move up to number three, this is extremely important. This is Lake Siranda, what is called nowadays Lake Siranda. You, you see, it's very close. It is a depression. There's no lake at all. There's nothing. There's some water sometimes when the monsoon during the during during August or sometimes at the end of January it drops some water. But it is an area where in the fifties and sixties a colleague a geologist, Professor Sned, did some interesting, interesting work. And uh, what as you see the Indus Delta and he here is uh, the Hub River. And Solari is located exactly at this point, have you seen before? So also in this case, the, the, the geographic situation is, is extremely complicated and very interesting. And this is again the Kirta range, which drops from Baluchistan, drops down into, into the ocean. And this is a Porali river, which drops into the Miani Ho, uh, Son Miani. Uh, for, 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 for most Europeans, and unfortunately it is uh, forbidden, at least uh, forbidden to whites, to move around here for several regions. So three huge rivers, something interesting over here, the Mianiho, Mianiho 
was extremely important location for the British who invaded uh, uh, this part of, of what, what, what was India or Baluchistan, whatever, uh, when they arrived. Next one. So if we go to uh, the location number one, this is the Bay of Taun, the bay is over here. Here's the open ocean, the Arabian Sea. You see how many shell millions, some real ones, we found. There are lots. They're all different. They are, uh, you know, of different ages. The most interesting one for, for, for us, is the one which gave quite a few features, is the number one over here. You see a lot of stones with uh, cup marks, and maybe this was an area where shells were open and, uh, you, you know, um, per, not perforators, but uh, percussion tools. Here's another one, which is uh, number three, quite huge. And this uh, won't be at um, high tide. When, when the tide is low, there's no bay at all, or just uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of water. And if we move to the next one again, the next slide, we can see something which is very interesting also for you. What uh, are the characteristics of the lithics, this Gadani shirt, the red, dark, red one, brownish, almost brownish. What, what are the characteristics of the, of the lithic artifacts of the very beginning of the Neolithic in the area? You know, very narrow, perfect, bladeless, very beautiful, bladeless cores. A few one and two geometric tools. Okay, they're all the same. You know, only this stuff. From Siranda we have something else. But if you, uh, these are the nearly six sides, number one and number tell, ten. But if you move down to this piece of, of, of flint or church, you see that it is totally different. This is the Bronze Age site. This is down number three. And the shirt is not local at all. It comes from Upper Sindh, most probably from the Rory Hills. Dimensions are different. The type of retouch is different. The color is different. The texture is different. So this is imported. And these are local. That is from uh, an outcrop, which is about 10 kilometers apart. Next one. Just a few more. Oh, this is uh, something which I showed you two slides before. Number three, Lake Siranga. Here's Mianiho, okay, the, 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 the mangrove swamp. And here you see a very clear depression, very, very shallow depression, which ends in the Kulkera Plain, which is uh, the most fertile area of uh, this part of Baluchistan. It's very, very nicely cultivated. There is a, also over here, there is a University of Agriculture. Okay. And here you have an idea how many shell meters and shell concentrations we found of different ages from the very beginning of the Neolithic up to the end of the Indus civilization. So, also in this case, the situation is the, the landscape is very complicated. Okay, Mianiho, sand dunes, you see the orientation of the sand dunes, these are mobile. When the wind blows, it blows in a way that comes from northeast to southwest. Here's the depression. Depression can be two or three meters uh, uh, below uh, the terraces uh, uh, around it. Here's a cool care plane. Fine. And what is this one? This Balakot, uh, which is in, in effect is called Kotbala, and not Balakot. But anyway, this is the village, the, not the village, the, the Hindu civilization site, which is supposed to be uh, a, 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 a place from which people during the Bronze Age moved down to Oman. But it is not on the sea, it's very far from the sea, it's about 15 kilometers from the sea, and it is facing the Kurkera plain. Okay, and what you have on the surface is a, a pretty good, good amount of shells, and I've dated uh, the surface of Balakot um, through um, terrible Palustri shells and so on. So, beautiful landscape, very interesting, 
size of different uh, ages. These are these light blue ones are the oldest ones. Then you have the blue ones here, and then the green, and then the yellow, and whatever. So different stages of development uh, of uh, shell maiden society there. What uh, what is uh, what happens sometimes to the so-called Lake Siranda? That it fills of water, and you never understand why. Uh, sometimes it doesn't rain, and the 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 the, 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 the former lagoon is full of uh, water, maybe from the Porali River, maybe from the Kyoto Range, or whatever you want. And here you have an idea of the location of some other sites which uh, which we found. This is number one, the first we found. Here the altitude, ten meters, and here are the Sanyani Hills, and so on. So here is four meters, three meters. You see the difference between the terraces around it and uh, the landscape into which uh, we found uh, the shell meters and so on. Next one. Huge uh, shell meters have been found uh, in a few places. This is number 29. You see how huge the site is. And all around it there are shells everywhere. We dated, we have three different days from this site. The surface, you see this Terebrana Pelustris over here. This one, I can't see it very well. And here you have some of the artifacts we found from number 29. This is very visible from uh, three, four, five kilometers. And this Lake Siranda, okay, as it was during that season when we went the first time. The second time, the third time, it was absolutely different. and absolutely dry, no water at all. And in some cases, we have, uh, you know, also on top of the dunes, which lead to, down to um, uh, Miani Ho, we have, uh, you know, shells on top of the dunes. You know, shells don't fly, so somebody took them to these places. Let's go to the next one. And this is interesting. It's not the last one. We have on, only one more. This is very interesting uh, for you, even though it is a, a little bit old, because it gives you an idea of um, the number of sites. These are the sites. We are radiocarbon dated from Lake Siranda, and it gives you know, all, all, all the sites have been dated from uh, mangrove swamp shells. Okay. And you have an idea of the major concentration of size. Most of them are Neolithic. We have a gap during the Copper Age, and then almost nothing. Now we have two or three days during the Bronze Age. So the interest, the interest of, of some people during the Neolithic was uh, this depression of Lake Siranda, okay, which was a lagoon. It was a real lagoon in, in, in the Arabian Sea. Now, then, then the lagoon was closed and the lake is filled by uh, rainwater, monsoon water, and uh, Porali river waters. But if you move down to Daun, that is the site I, I showed you before, you see how different is the situation. Just a few Neolithic sites, almost nothing during the Copper Age, Chalcolithic, and then many radiocarbon dates and many sites which have been settled during the Bronze Age. So, when you find a site in, in a place and find sites in, 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 in along a, another beach, and along, along another shore, whatever you want, you see that until you don't have dated the, the, the settlements, you, have, you cannot have a precise idea of their age. I don't show you the... the the material we found, maybe next time when I come, for sure. But anyway, here you have a paramount view of a very limited region from which we knew absolutely nothing until 20 years ago. The last one is... Uh, okay, the next one. Is uh, uh, a view of uh, one of the canals of Mianiho. Mianihor is a fantastic place, very, very beautiful. And you see the mangrove swamp is very, very thick. We've never been looking for, for size in this area because it is impenetrable. It's extremely difficult to cross, almost impossible. But when you move 
further through the north and you get into the depression, which, which you can see also through Google Earth, it's very easy to see. Uh, I don't know why nobody nobody ever noticed that, but it's a very clear depression. And when you have this kind of depressions, for sure, and they are very, uh, they are located very close to the sea, you're sure that there are shell millions around the, them. The situation is identical in Oman. Okay, what what does it mean? The the coastline, which uh, we have nowadays in Sint and Las Vila formed around the end of the Indus civilization, during the end of the Bronze Age, or slightly maybe 500 years before. But during the Neolithic, the situation was extremely difficult, different. The, 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 the aridification had, had not begun, and the, the, the coastline was more up and down, rounded, whatever there were, lagoons and so on. And you have the Shanbidan sites inside, uh, near, close to the shores of the ancient, these ancient uh, lagoons. So this is another point which is very interesting. The last one, because it is 1.21, it is just uh, for your students or for anybody who who can can be interested in uh, in um, in uh, in reading something that is uh, uh, some of the some some of the papers which have been written during uh, the last uh, years as you see the first one is 2006 and 2024 whatever, which have been published regarding oman in some cases and also regarding uh, sindh uh, las bela that is this part southeast of baluchistan and so on so and they are all available because uh, they are available through internet, so everybody who is interested can 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 read them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Biaji. It was a wonderful overview of uh, the Shelmidan sites, right from Oman to Pakistan. And I think on the Indian side, it is a continuation of all these uh, evidences. And uh, once we have a better chronology from our side, it will be really uh, great to compare them and also to know whether they were interacting between each other or not. So thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you have so many around there. Very yeah. many, for sure. Yeah. The, the, the important thing is to, is to understand that if the eventual uh, relationships uh, between each other, what you have in the interior, because you know, you know shell means reflect some kind of activity which was taken, which was carried out uh, along the coast. And what about the interior? I couldn't move uh, in, in Baluchistan in the interior, but I'm sure that, that uh, you know, Mergar is not the only site <laughs> in Baluchistan. There are so many between Merga and, and the coastlines everywhere. But you just have to walk and uh, you know check accurately and uh, whatever you find, just uh, collect one sample and date it. That is. Yeah. Now I request uh, Sharda, uh, can you take over and moderate the question and answer session? We have a few questions. Yes, I request the participants to type their questions in the chat box. Uh, Professor, I see one question here. Can you hear me yeah. clearly? Yeah. So the first question is by Nitesh Konde. Uh, he's asking whether such sites have been recorded from the Kutch region, um, the run of Kutch region. Sorry, what is the? So he's asking whether uh, Nitesh, that's the participant, uh, he's asking whether uh, similar sites have been recorded from the run of Kutch region. Oh no! I I went to that's that's a, that's an interesting question because I went to the Ranokats to the Pakistani part. I went down to to the border also with, with the Rangers, and uh, I know that Professor Khan in the seventies discovered uh, he reports about uh, a shell midden or two shell middens in that region, a little bit north of the run of Kutch. And within the run of Kutch, 
uh, I don't know if you, if you know the landscape, but anyway, close to Bardin, in Bardin there is a small museum, he found also a Indus civilization site, which I've never, which I've not been able to, to find because the you know, professor can never gave any precise indication of the sites. So, so it was, but I'm sure, I'm a hundred percent sure that in this region, they are interesting, very interesting, not only Shell Middens, but also Bronze Age, uh, you know, villages or something like that. I'm sure that, 100%. The next question is by Shikha. And she asks, um, do you feel that the idea of wasteland, that is what the Britishers called it, wasteland, do you think that uh, uh, labeling lands as wasteland, this, this kind of evidence breaks our idea that emergence of civilization can only originate around rivers? Uh, the, the point is that, that nobody can live without water. <laughs> <laughs> in any period, <laughs> obviously, if you don't drink, especially in an environment like that, in two, in three, in three days you are dead, finished. So, <laughs> uh, but the the point in, on my experience, uh, uh, you know, you cannot compare the Indus River with many other rivers of the world for one simple reason, that the Indus drop down for altitude almost vertically from altitudes which are 7,000 meters, 8,000 meters. It drops down and when it goes down into, into the plain, okay, in some regions, in, in some areas, in, during some periods, it makes unbelievable floods, okay? So, Yes, uh, civilization, of course, uh, started in areas which are suitable for building uh, cities or villages or whatever. But uh, in, in my experience, uh, the Indus is not, uh, even though there are in, in interesting sites like, uh, I don't know, like Enjotaro or Mohenjo-Daro or whatever you want. But if you go to... If you go to Bahawalpur uh, state, uh, along the Hakra or Gaga River, there are so many sites in environment which is very, very different from that of the Indus. Okay. And over there, everywhere, there are benches, there are also, also shells, shells which are, are updated and whatever. And uh, along uh, uh, this ancient river, which has now uh, partly disappeared, Yes, fine. That is an area from which uh, you, for sure, you can do a lot of work, not only on the Bronze Age, but also something which is much older, Chalcolithic, and even older. And, and the same is in some areas of Punjab. Uh, I, I've been there uh, a few years ago, and I found uh, quite a few unbelievable mounds of, of the Copper Age. But the point is... Um, uh, you, you know that already for archaeology. The point is, the point number one is walking. If you don't walk, you don't find anything. <laughs> and that is the point. <laughs> so there's a follow-up question from the same participant. Uh, she asks, are the shells in the Bahawalpur region, are they marine or freshwater uh, in origin? Freshwater. Freshwater. I, I gave a colleague, uh, one of your colleagues in India, the, the radical camel days which I obtained, I can I have also the the precise location. I don't remember the dates now, but they are they are nearly anyway. There was also some pottery which I couldn't re, uh, recognize. Yeah, I'm sure, but you know, in, in many cases, I I can make a, a very simple example. The Taro Hill is a huge, fortified, unbelievably beautiful. Copper Age site in Sindh. It is on an island. Fine. It is covered with shells. There are shells everywhere. They are never being mentioned by anybody. I don't understand why. When you see shells which are not along the coast, which are somewhere maybe 
in, in the interior of, 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 of a shore or the shoreline or a coastline 20, 30, 40 kilometers. So you have to ask yourself what happened. Why are they there? There must be a reason. And the reason is men. They've been transported. They don't fly. You know. <laughs> Uh, the next two questions are from Professor Ajit Prasad. So his first question is, what is the nature of the microlithic technology that you come across in the lithic assemblages around the shell midden sites? And the second question is, is there any evidence of crested ridge technology in the microlith production from any of these sites? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if, if I can reply correctly. But anyway, <clears throat> anyway, the oldest assemblage is I have uh, in, in Las Bela, they're very, very poor, all right? But now you can recognize them easily uh, on the basis of uh, the cores, okay, which are narrow-bladed cores, and they're all exhausted, because in Las Bela there's no, no chart. So they had to use uh, the, the stuff down to the end. So bladelets, okay, the cores usually always are um, with uh, one prepared platform, sometimes two prepared platforms, but one, one, one is, is a rule. And then you have different varieties of geometrics, which in my opinion are different from the Mesolithic geometrics. That is, you have, I, I, for example, I've never seen any Microburin in Las Bela or in Daoun. Microburins are very common in the Tar Desert, where you have Mesolithic, what I think they are Mesolithic sites. Uh, there is a variety of trapeces um, uh, according to the different areas from where I, I, I collected them. Lake Siranda, for example, or a new site which uh, I didn't tell you about, which is in, 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 or, 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 which is also in this case, or the end of the eighth millennium is very, located very close to Tata, and uh, uh, those found in in Merga, which are roughly of the same age, maybe slightly later, a few centuries, and. Uh, those are the Tar Desert around Hyderabad, very close to India, in fact, 30, 40 kilometers from India, um, which have been collected from uh, a, a salt, a, a, an area of, uh, of salt uh, lakes. So we are just uh, at the beginning of uh, the study of these uh, phenomena, and uh, until we don't have a very good series of radiocarbon dates is very difficult to provide a very precise definition. But anyway, in my opinion, there are differences, uh, very, close, very clear difference between what we call Neolithic, the Chalcolithic, and the Bronze Age. We know very little about the Bronze Age, but anyway, the Neolithic uh, assemblages are characterized by very, very thin, small bladelets. If you move to the cooperation, the Chalcolithic, and it is 1,000 years before Mohenjo-Daro, roughly, the retouch of the, the tools uh, is uh, very, very easy to distinguish because, because it is a kind of semi-abrupt retouch, which was not used before and was not used later. And the tools are different are blade tools uh, and uh, uh, the triangles are different, uh, very, very different different from the Neolithic ones and so on. So in my opinion, nowadays, after 20, 25 years of work, we have uh, some points uh, which have been uh, clarified uh, and uh, we, which we can distinguish uh, quite easily. The point is, the Neolithic was, in effect, a long period. Fine. We know nothing about it. At least in Sindhu. Okay, or, or in Balochistan. 
But when you have a, a Neolithic, an early Neolithic blade letter, you can easily recognize it from an upper Paleolithic bladelet or a Mesolithic bladelet or a Copper Age one or a Bronze Age one, that roughly. But the chronology of these bladelets can be roughly interpreted within some 1,000 years. So we need in the future, maybe you have the, you will have the good occasion in your region where you can you can work uh, you know more 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 quietly than in Pakistan. Yeah, you will have the possibility of making this kind of distinct uh, distinct uh, you know uh, differences between what is earlier and what is late within these one thousand one thousand five hundred years. And and the, there is another there is another point uh, the 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 raw material which has been utilized in Las Pela we have uh, a source I didn't tell you about it because we had no time which is Gadani um, dark red brownish shirt and that was utilized within a radius of more or less fifty kilometers. Okay, and was not utilized during, during the Bronze Age. That is one point which is very, very clear. If you move east of Karachi in Sindh, it is not the same, totally different. Shirt from Gadani Cape doesn't exist anymore at all. It was not transported over very long distances at all. While the Rory Hill Church, yes, fine, that, that moved quite a lot. But we have other sources which we know nothing about. For sure. So, is that okay, or, or he wanted to know something else? Is that fine? Uh, he has one more question, uh, which okay. is on the <clears throat> which is on the autoliths um, that oh, you have autolith. used that you have used for dating. So, he wants to know yeah. if they are from marine or fish, or uh, freshwater yes. fishes, and can you comment on the genus or the family level identification sure. of the autoliths? The, 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 they have been published uh, in one of the papers I put in the list, uh, maybe in the one which is um, uh, on, which has been published on Discover Oceans, eh, which is a new journal by Springer. Yes, these are extremely important. They come, they've been dated from two different species of uh, marine fishes, which are quite big, and they are quite common all over the Indian Ocean, not uh, also in India and in Bangladesh, but they are also moving east. And uh, I dated them mainly because I wanted to know if they were contemporaneous to the Shell Midas or not. And the result is that only one is a, is a, a Neolithic specimen. All the others are much, much more recent. Maybe they, they've been brought to 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 uh, Lake Siranda uh, sometimes when when um, you know in, in much much more recent times. So uh, if you have a look at the, uh, I'll show you. In, in the slides, I, I don't have it in there. Anyway, in the slide with my bibliography, there is one paper which was published this year in January, which is an open, free, whatever. And you have all the list of about 150, 160 radiocarbon dates which have been obtained from all over the region. So you have a complete paramount of uh, what's been done during during the last 24 years. The last question, incidentally, is about radiocarbon dating, or rather the absence of it. So um, this question is by Rukia Nakash. Uh, if we don't have the, any kind of samples for radiocarbon dating, then what mm. else could be the, what other specimens or samples could, or um, artifacts could be the yardstick in terms of getting the time period of these sites? So it is, it is it is not easy, you know, but uh, in that case, uh, you need a, a very, very good uh, uh, material remains, uh, artifacts, uh, 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 well radiocarbon dated from, from somewhere else. If you don't have them, 
you know it is it is extremely it is extremely difficult and you have to look for some kind of uh, organogenic material which can be used for dating i system i what what i did also in oman but here also in in, in pakistan what i did was um, systematically collect one sample yeah now now we can date one sample years ago we i needed more but anyway in the last uh, 15 years i systematically collected one sample of one adult specimen because you know for example cerebral pollutus and all i think also telescopy i don't know but anyway cerebral when uh, they're very little when they're very young they feed in a certain way and when they are grown up they feed in another way so to be more you know systematic i prefer to collect always whenever it was possible always the same part of um, a shell and send it for adult and send it for dating always to the same laboratory i always used and also because i'm in touch they are my my colleagues and my friends and whenever there is a a a, a problem a phenomenon which which is not so clear they write to me and tell you well, what is this what is that and we we can and another thing which is extremely important for radiocarbon dating is the delta 13c which for as an indicator of mangrove swamp is always negative just a little bit negative, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus, minus five, minus six, whatever. When you have an individual which which grew up in, in the ocean, that is in the sea, it's always positive. So you can recognize on the basis of the Delta 13 C whether uh, uh, the shell grew up in a mangrove, because y yes, uh, mangrove shells all over the world are all the same, you know, they're terrible evolution and telescopium. But there, there are also uh, some kind of archa, for example, whatever, which, which grow in the mangrove swamp. And thanks to the, the thing, you can recognize whether they were, they grew up within the mangrove swamp or somewhere else. So it's very important to, to report this kind of data. Okay. Yeah, I think we've taken all the questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Um, so thank thank you thank you very much for, for listening to 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 my shell millions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. I mean, it was a wonderful talk and a lot of materials to look into, and we really look forward to your. Uh, visit and um, i also thank all the participants for uh, sparing the time and uh, listening to this wonderful talk and i also request yeah. you all to join again uh, and next month where we'll be having one more talk to listen to thank you thank you once again professor Biaji. thank, thank, you, to thank you. you 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 can share the, the powerpoint to your students and your colleagues uh, okay sure. you can do whatever you want with it sure, no sure. problem at all sure. okay <laughs> Sure. Thank you. So, thank, thank you so you, much. Professor. Thank you, Michelle and uh, Purva. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon then. <laughs> <laughs>